I'm an architect who's been involved in green technologies for about 30 years. I started out back in the 1970s when the whole movement was really in the hands of a fairly small group of artists who worked principally in New York City, in Los Angeles, and in Italy. And they were approaching the whole uh, realm from the idea uh, that uh, green could be an integral part of a new art movement. Uh, into the 1980s, uh, green started to become about culture. How could culture and architecture, culture and uh, green technologies inform the way architecture was evolving? It was part of a much larger movement called uh, postmodernism at the time. Green was a smaller part of that movement, but it was still an important part. Into the 1990s, it sort of blossomed again through the idea of material technologies. What was recycled material? How could recycled material play a part in uh, what was going on in architecture and design? And uh, since the 1990s, I think it's really sort of blossomed into a marriage of green technologies and um, a lot of the things that, that came before. So you've got now a sort of blending of science and technology and nature and design. Over the last 30 years, I've, I've had all sorts of, uh, of inspiration. Uh, other artists that I've worked with, um, traveling, um, uh, food, uh, buildings, uh, uh, you name it. But uh, for about the last 10 years or so, I've been particularly interested in the relationship between uh, science and nature and how essentially they're two sides of the same coin. They're both philosophies of life. And I think one of the most important bridges uh, is uh, design uh, and uh, technology. That design and technology are somehow uh, possible bridges between uh, these uh, different uh, philosophical interpretations of what life is all about. Well, I'm, a, I'm a, um, an overnight sensation that's been at this for 30 years. Um, what I found now is, uh, while my client base was always varied and international, I'm now getting, uh, I'd say, um, a much broader client base than, I, than I've ever had before. I'm working internationally um, uh, in ways that I never expected. Uh, uh, being asked to do uh, new housing developments, new models for housing, uh, uh, new uh, technological innovations, um, and uh, sort of marrying advanced technology to architecture and design. So while I, uh, earlier in my career I enjoyed um, uh, commissions where I was being called upon to be an architect or designer and uh, to bring you know maybe a cutting edge uh, sensibility to things now I'm being asked to um, work on things where you can really integrate uh, new approaches to technology and um, and green and design so it's this for me it's a wonderful folding together of all these different facets of the things I've been involved in for 30 years art science technology um, new attitudes towards nature and uh, it's just, it's, it's a wonderful thing. I'm really enjoying it. There's sort of a couple of answers to, to the, the notion of where we might be, uh, or the, the question as to where we might be in 10 years. On the one hand, there's the very serious issue that a lot of uh, scientists tell us that we have about 10 years to really grapple with the major environmental problems that we have on the planet, or we're going to reach a point of no return. And there are you know, enormously serious consequences. You're talking about uh, the failure of global systems and mass starvation, and, uh, ir irreversible species decline, and all the sort of bad news things. On the other hand, um, clearly uh, in many, if not all, but certainly in many of the cases, we have in hand now all of the technological resources, the scientific insight, uh, and the information that we need to proceed to fix this stuff. So it's my sincere hope and my daily endeavor um, that we move forward with the, uh, the things that we have in hand and we solve the problems and that we're you know, going to be looking at a, um, a renewed sense of optimism, renewed sense of possibility, and we're going to be able to continue as an industrial um, society. I approach the whole green issue as follows. About 90% of the problem is energy impacts. 
Um, so when you're looking at anything, when you're looking at point of manufacture, uh, when you're looking at embodied energy, when you're looking at operating costs, when you're looking at short-term, long-term impacts, the longevity of the product in the market, and so forth, and so on, uh, really the major issue is energy impacts because it's, it's the profligate waste of energy that's creating so many of our problems, certainly relating to, to global warming, and, and now we're seeing food riots because you know energy um, has, is being displaced from the production of food into uh, uh, feeding uh, rapidly expanding economies in Asia and so forth and so on. Now, the, the underlying uh, kind of factoid or reality uh, here is that 90% of the energy that we consume today is wasted, fully 90% of it. And because we have the technological capabilities to offset 90% of our energy consumption, and we don't, um, the words that come to mind are immoral, criminal, <laughs> horrifying, uh, profligate, uh, nothing good, nothing good. So for me, it's, it's energy impact, and that's directly related to uh, global warming and these, and these other problems. Now, some companies have been in the forefront, and they may have met or exceeded the metrics that are around today. Some of the metrics that are around today for measuring what's green and what isn't are facile. Some of them are generated by um, industry uh, interest groups, uh, and, and some of them aren't. But it's, it's very hard to wade through this stuff. There's no hierarchy, and we lack a lot of leadership um, uh, on, on these matters. Um, uh, some of it's inevitable because it's it's consensus based. And when you have consensus based um, systems, inevitably there's this compromise. So that's why for me, um, uh, it's important to to realize that when everything is equally important, nothing is very important. And what's very important here is energy uh, during the during manufacture, during shipping, uh, and um, during uh, use. And uh, of course, also the, the the ability of the product to persist uh, in its environment for uh, for a number of years. I always recommend *Omnivore's Dilemma* by Michael Pollan, because Michael Pollan, uh, uh, in that book, explains the connection between food production and energy. And it's it was named by the New York Times as one of the most important books um, of the last several years, uh, and it really helps the reader understand where we are as a culture, how absolutely and utterly, irreconcilably addicted we are to oil. Uh, the omnivore's dilemma in simple language is we're omnivores, we eat everything. However, 90% of what we eat in, t in, in modern culture is um, derived from petro petroleum. Uh, beef is derived from petroleum. Corn is derived from petroleum. Soybeans are derived from pet petroleum. So ultimately, the vast majority of our diet is oil-based and specifically corn-based. About 90% of what we eat in one way, shape, or form or another is based on corn, and the majority of corn production is tied to oil production. An interesting example is the average steer takes six to 800 gallons of petroleum to bring to market and a lot of it is feed and antibiotics. And that's all petroleum based. So once you start understanding how um, uh, inextricably uh, linked we are to uh, oil in our day-to-day -day lives, then your eyes are open and you start seeing it everywhere. And then you start thinking about alternatives. And then you understand why local food is so important. And you understand the, the profound, um, profoundly alienating effect this culture uh, has had on us and our families. And, and so f for me, that's, that's a real, really important book to read as a basis for understanding. And after that, you know, you can sort of find your own way. I think that's the one. Omnivore's Dilemma.